Target. How low were you on that one? About target and a half. Yeah. So we were shooting the fire hose belt? Yeah, I think we were shooting the belt. Oh, ho, 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 ho. outstanding. How low are you aiming on that one? Right on. Straight on? Yeah. Oh. Oh, you could count the second between the shots. Yeah, I, the... I was about to call a miss. I thought you were yeah. aiming at the 100. Took a minute to get out there, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Took its sweet time, that's for sure. 200 yards to lift. Well, I've taken the camera to the range a few times when I've had trapdoor Springfield out. And thought it appropriate to at least do some sort of an introduction. Explain a little bit. This isn't meant to be a all-encompassing tutorial on the trapdoor Springfield, but I think it's a really neat rifle. I think it's worth taking a closer look at. I have two examples here. Mine and my best friend's. Uh, his is a nicer condition than mine, which often happens. He's quite the collector. He fired, he fired mine the first time and was so taken with it he had to find a nice example of his own to shoot. Uh, he looked upon this one at a gun show. But most anyone who knows anything about Trapdoor Springfields knows that it was a, its design was a cost cutting measure right after the Civil War. The nation was awash in um, muzzle loading rifles even though technology had advanced to the point that uh, some sort of breech loading, cartridge firing rifle was what every self-respecting nation was going to to arm their troops with. And we had just fought a very expensive civil war and so a man named Allen, last name of Allen, came up with the idea to cut off all the muskets off, or the rifled muskets off at the breech end and, and fit this this receiver so that you could single load cartridges and uh, it was a great success. They ended up uh, first models just had this little receiver stub, this receiver section attached to the end of the of a regular Springfield rifled musket and and they began sleeving the barrels to obtain smaller and smaller calibers and eventually they just made them from scratch. Uh, but this example that I'm holding in my hands is what I'm going to be featuring in the uh, actual shooting portion of the video. And I was uh, very impressed uh, with it when I got it. It's in fairly decent shape. The bore is very, very nice. Uh, I guess if I were going to be kind I would call its deficiencies patina. Uh, yes, it has uh, it has quite a bit of surface finish challenges, I guess. Uh, you can see quite a bit of uh, modeling and uh, browning of the uh, of the color on the barrel. You know, most of the most of the metal has some sort of brownish patina uh, left on it but it is mechanically sound. It has some neat features and we'll talk about those. I brought along my best friend's rifle. Well, he was kind enough to loan it to me for this introduction to this trapdoor video. Uh, ironically, even though his is in far nicer shape than mine, um, it's a bit older than mine is. Um, I've dated mine, your manufacturer, as 1893 and his as 1887. So not a whole lot of year difference but uh, you'll notice some of the beautiful beautiful case colors remaining on his actual door portion. These were all case hardened and uh, in most examples the case hardening is uh, completely faded off. Of course case hardening will fade you know it's not a particularly the color case hardening is not particularly durable finish and the color part will wear off over time although the hardness that it imparts uh, will remain. It's beautiful, beautiful, uh, brilliant case hardening colors. Um, 
whereas on my rifle, they're there, but oh, only in the very protected areas. And if you open it up, you can see some vestiges of case color remaining, but uh, yeah, a lot more wear to the finish on mine. surface finish on his is much nicer. I brought his along somewhat to show, hey, there's some very nice examples out there still that you can still find. And I believe this was about an $800 to $900 rifle, this one here that I'm holding. And I didn't actually pay out right for mine. Mine involved some trades. Embarrassed to say I probably have a lot more invested in mine just because of if you follow the trail of trades that finally netted me this, um, yeah, he, he came out much better than I did. But one of the reasons I brought his along, not only to show the difference in, in condition between the two, but um, configuration. Both of them have what is known as a Buffington rear sight. And the only thing I wanted to point out about the Buffington rear sight and it was kind of a precision rear sight and if you if you pay a whole lot of attention to this rear sight if you've ever messed around with O3 Springfields and the like um, you can kind of see where the O3 Springfield got its rear sight from um, you know when you when you turn this knob you can see that the whole sight would would pivot left and right I really don't want to turn that because I already have this sighted in um, but one thing that struck me as really neat about the Buffington rear sight is you can certainly notice, anybody doesn't take a very practiced eye to notice that this rear sight, this slot, has not been cut straight. It's certainly cut at an angle. And that was because they understood that at extreme distances particularly, the 4570 bullet tended to drift. Um, it tended to drift because a large bullet like that out of a rifle, the rifling inspires in uh, imparts a twist to the bullet, and as it's at extreme ranges and it's dropping, uh, the air pressure underneath the bullet is greater than the air pressure on top of the bullet, and it's essentially ever so slightly rolling in the direction of the spin is rolling on top of that higher pressure air and so they noticed that over extreme distances and these sites were graduated at 2,000 yards uh, they certainly understood that at, at that extreme range you're going to have quite a bit of drift that is imparted to that bullet so they manufactured the sites to adjust for that the U.S. Army flirted with briefly in its history the uh, ramrod bayonet and it's interesting that it was experimented with earlier even before my buddy's rifle was made they experimented with this and they ultimately quit using this feature but then evidently late in manufacture they they brought it back and that's you know called the rod the rod bayonet um, essentially the cleaning rod itself um, acts as a bayonet so you don't have to have an actual blade bayonet my friend's rifle has a standard cleaning rod which is what you would have found on most most of these old rifles you can see the the cleaning jag um, serrations on the end of it you know the sole purpose of this was uh, to, uh, to clean your rifle with if you wanted to mount a bayonet you know it was a typical bayonet of those types you know if a, if a fellow wanted to mount a bayonet uh, he'd have to slide this socket on here, twist it over, and it would uh, it would lock into place. There you have a bayonet. 
I guess the ordnance board thought, you know, we issue these soldiers rifles and maybe they might leave their bayonet behind and they might forget to take their bayonet with them or, or it takes too long to pull off their belt and attach. I don't know. But fellows at Springfield Army thought it was a really great idea if they design a rifle so that the bayonet is always with it. So they took the regular cleaning rod and they made this funky little attachment on the end of it. They made the, uh, the cleaning rod thicker so you could sharpen it on the end and turn it into a, a, an actual bayonet. If you twist this contraption, that unlocks the bayonet. You twist it. To have the bayonet with you at all times. I thought that was a great idea, I guess. And you could take it all the way out and then screw some sort of cleaning jag onto the end of this. If you tried to take a standard cleaning rod and turn it into a bayonet, leaving it at the same diameter, uh, it wouldn't be very effective. Too small, too flexible. So, to make a cleaning rod bayonet they had to thicken it up considerably but I guess they thought this was all all you needed as it almost looks like a Phillips head screwdriver tip on it the first time I saw one of these I thought what a lousy idea I know that the the French during World War one had a they called it a knitting needle bayonet you know just poke little holes in people and I guess it the theory being that you're really just going to be a, you don't actually have to have a knife style bayonet to slice a big sword type wound in somebody you just poke holes in them and you're gonna yeah, probably stop them and then you're gonna set up some sort of infection and I'm gonna put this back in my rifle one of the reasons I mentioned the uh, the cleaning rod bayonet is this cleaning rod bayonet contraption reared its ugly head again when uh, the 03 Springfield was first developed and was first brought out. This was one of the very last rifles that they made, made in the last year of manufacture. I'm guessing that, I don't know, I'm not a collector, a, a trap in the butt. Uh, I don't know if all of them have this, my buddies does not. Um, but I imagine if you have a cleaning rod bayonet that just has a threaded end to put a cleaning jag on, you're probably going to have to have some compartment to put cleaning jags in. So, Mine was made the very last year they made them. His was made in 1887. Why is his in such better shape than mine? I don't know who owned mine before me. This could have happened during its military service or it could have lost most of its finish in a private collection. These were not prized by a lot of people. These were cheap surplus arms for a while. And mine was made the very last year they made them because the U.S. Army adopted the Krag Jorgensen rifle. It wasn't like they, they took the last rifles off the assembly line and said, well, we're making these Krags, everybody's getting these Krags now, let's just put these into storage. And this would have been issued to somebody, you know, during the Spanish-American War. We, there were plenty of troops still using Springfields. And Springfields certainly would have been something that would have been issued to the National Guard, any kind of reserve type troops. It wouldn't at all be unexpected for something like this, even though it's a last year of production rifle to have been issued and been run hard and put up wet. I didn't notice it at the time, some of my videos, but the actual lever here that locks didn't close all the way in some of mine. It was protruding up just a little bit about like, about like that. I didn't notice it at the time. Um, and that was because some of the bullets I had were a little bit too fat and they were bumping up against the beginning of the rifling and it wasn't allowing the, the cartridge to be completely seated as far as I wanted it to. So the breech was having to kind of cam the cartridge in there and this didn't want to lock all the way. But it's, it's almost like it has a safety feature built in. If this isn't locked all the way, if it's completely up like this, it's going to block the hammer fall. The hammer will not be able to hit the firing pin. 
and if it's just up a little bit, the hammer in the act of falling forward will cam it down into place. And if it can't cam it down far enough, then it won't actually strike the firing pin with any force. So it's, it's really kind of a neat system. So even though I had trouble with some of my rounds, and they left the, the, the actual lock for the breech bolt up a little bit, uh, the built-in safety of the uh, actual hammer riding on that uh, prevented any accidents. And they all fired just fine. Something else you'll probably notice, and you may wonder why it's doing this or how it's doing this, or you may not, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it's neat, it has this little extractor over here on the, uh, on the inside, on the side. And when you open up the breech, that activates that extractor. And it's kind of spring-loaded. It pops out with quite some force. And it just knocks the brass back. So the brass comes back and it hits this little stud right here. And it's just a little ramp. And it just launches the brass out of the chamber. I brought along a piece of empty brass just to show you. I think it's kind of neat. But as soon as you open up the uh, open up the breech, it's just going to flip that brass right out of there. Did he take his ears out? All right, trap door to Springfield yeah, at a little did. over 100 yards. That's a lesson he won't forget. Load it up. That's what I was doing. You nailed it. Yeah, it wasn't left. If it was left, it was going left of the head. So, cool. I can repeat it. Yep. Unfortunately, the wind is blowing the smoke over here, <laughs> so your shot gets, your film shot gets obscured a bit. That's that grin I wanted to see. <laughs> He's smiling, he can't help it. Target. <clears throat> it's about 120 yards. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> that is nothing like shooting that. There is absolutely zero discomfort with shooting it. Zero. It's a nice boom and a nice push. You gotta do that one more time. Tell me when you're ready. Send it. Target. Thank you. 